I'm really excited about today's episode because we're going to talk with my friend, Mark Byron Dallas, who you might remember from a few other episodes and a reference in one of my YouTube videos. He's a fantastic guy to talk to about dialect coaching. So he primarily works with people on stage and screen versus me. I do accent coaching with pretty much anybody, but including actors as well. So we're going to talk today about what's called a lexical set, and that's going to help you with vocabulary. It's going to help you with your accent. It's going to help you with how to kind of write things down in a way that you can remember and categorize them in your brain. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I'm here to help you master an American accent in English because your voice is your choice when it comes to how you sound. If you want to see the full video of the episode, it's available at Accent Coach Bianca on YouTube. Now, here we go, me and Mark talking about lexical sets. Hey, Mark, so nice to see you. How have you been? Hey, Bianca. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Busy, That's but, awesome. um, but surviving. <laughs> <laughs> busy, busy, busy. I know. I'm the same yeah. way. I've started How my YouTube you? channel. How are you doing? Great. I'm starting my YouTube channel now. And so I'm also busy, busy, busy. Like it takes a lot of extra work. But I think sometimes like when you do one thing, it just inspires you to do a whole bunch of other things, which then in turn cause more work. So it's like, exactly. I don't know, I'm shooting myself in the foot, but I love it. And And that reminds me of why we're here today is that I saw on your social media, you've been doing this word of the day, accent word of the day, coaching word of the day. And so tell us a little bit about that, because we want to talk today about what's called lexical sets. So maybe you can define what a lexical set is, why it's important, and how we kind of thought of this idea. So go for it. Okay, yeah. So lexical sets are, sometimes actors call them the kit list. I forgive them for that. And a lexical set, basically, there's a whole bunch of them. And there's about 24 to 27. And it varies depending on the accent. What it is, it's kind of like an underlying structure of syllables. It's hard to make this sound interesting, but the thing is about lexical, the thing about lexical sets is that once you figure out what it actually is, it's amazing. It, it's so amazing. useful. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like the name is a bit scary. Ooh, lexical sets. I don't know if I want to listen to a podcast episode about lexical sets, but y that's just the name. Like, let's just hang in there yeah. and see how useful and amazing these things are too. For everybody who doesn't already know you, which they should, because they've listened to my podcast before, hopefully, fingers crossed. Mark, can you give us a little introduction about who you are, where you are, what you're doing? Of course, yeah. I'm Mark Byron Dallas. I include the Byron, the middle name, because there's loads of Mark Dallases. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to try to find me online, that, that's how to find me. I'm a dialect coach, among other things. I'm also an actor. And what I do basically as a dialect coach is I help actors sound like people from other places. Mm -hmm. So whenever they are auditioning for a role or they have booked a role, basically, if the person that they're playing is from a different place and or a different time from when or where they are, mm -hmm. I help them sound like that person. That's Super what authentic, do. really important. And we, maybe we could even add to that place, time and even like culture too, or subculture even because you could be in the same time and place, but you could have your own way of speaking different than your neighbors in the same time as well. Yeah, I see well, that. Well, your way of speaking can be completely different to your twin sibling. Exactly, so, exactly. And, we can and that's called an specific. idiolect. Mm -hmm. um, so there is another word I, I just threw <laughs> out there. That, that's why I created Dialect Coaches Word of the Day, so I could explain what these words are. But lexical sets are really awesome. If you want to swing back around to that. Yeah, um, let's dive into lexical sets okay. then. So lexical in terms of vocabulary, some people know the word lexical or lexicon. And then a set, of course, is a group of things. And like you said, we've got a lot of different sets that exist out there. And maybe we should kind of talk about the benefits first of a lexical set. Like, why would I care about this thing? Okay, well, it's a kind of blueprint for anybody who is learning a certain way of speaking especially if they're learning to speak English or they want to learn a certain accent in English. As we know, and all of your viewers understand, there are loads, hundreds of different accents, right? So different accents, different varieties of, of English, they tend to have different structures underlying them as well. So all of your viewers know about different speech sounds or phones. They probably know about phonemes and how different words have different vowels, monophones, diphthongs, and so on, which are 
sometimes monophones are diphthongs in other accents and vice mm-hmm. versa. Mm-hmm. So the thing about lexical sets is that they represent the different kinds of syllables that can exist, or rather they represent the vowel sounds or thongs mm-hmm. that can exist within certain syllables. So for example, if we're talking about the, the word that it represents the noun of the verb think, what would that be for you? What is that that is in your head when you're thinking? It is a what? Say, say it again. Ask me the question again, because I want to give you what you're looking for again. So okay. when you think okay. of the I word think. The, uh-huh. I, w- I want you to say a word ah. that is spelled T-H-O-U-G-H-T. How would uh-huh. you pronounce that? Yeah. Ah, I see what you're saying. So I'm going to think of the past of the verb think, which is thought. <laughs> and when I hear this O-U-G-H portion, I think of Aw, like I see a cute kitten or a puppy and I say, aw, to me, that's the sound that I'm making. And I know that can be so confusing for people who didn't grow up with English as a first language because you see O-U-G-H and that could be like, what, 10, 10 different things, 12, something like that? So many different uh-huh, things, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, so many different things because the O-U-G-H can be ow, it can be uh, off, off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so many exactly, things. exactly. So I would like you to say the word that is spelled L-O-T. Ah, okay. So for me, I most of the time I would have to say it's almost like Oz and box, right? Lot. I like you a lot. Ah. Sometimes I find myself going a little bit more of the awe and thought, and I say a lot, a lot. And then sometimes even a little bit between them, I have to say, but but when I'm teaching, then I pick one and I stick to it because most people they want a black and white answer, right? They want to know what's quote unquote right. And so we have to then talk about mergers and Things like that. So it can be a little bit tricky. And so for you, when you say the O-U-G-H and then this letter O, for you, are they the same? Are they different? Does it depend on the day of the week? Well, uh, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Okay. So the thing is, as most people have probably heard, my accent is not American. I do live in Canada and I've lived in Canada for more than 20 years now, but it's definitely not a Canadian accent. Mm -hmm. And I'm originally from England. So my accent is kind of a hybrid. I mean, everybody's Mm -hmm. accent is a hybrid Mm -hmm. to some degree because, you know, we move places and so on and and we start to pick up accents from the people that are surrounding us. So for me, most of the time, I still have that difference between the all in thought Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the all in lot. Yeah. However, the people around me here in Canada, most people in Canada, those are the same sound. Mm -hmm. So they would say thought and lot. But in the United States, it depends where in the United States you are, right? (laughs) So like you, it was interesting to hear you say that sometimes you pronounce them differently, like thought and lot. And and sometimes they're the same, thought and lot. Exactly. So it, it really depends. Now, the whole point of this, the reason I mentioned those two words is because those two words are head words for two of the lexical sets. And as we've just shown, we've just demonstrated in some accents, the sound in lot words like not and on and pond and sock, uh, I would say sock. Yeah. So those words for some accents, they will have the same sound as words that are in the thought set. So, you know, sock, thought, caught. Cot could be C A H T, the past mm-hmm. of the match, or it could be C O T, like a crib that you put a baby in. So those are just two of like 24 to 27 different lexical sets that mm-hmm. will be, you know, some accents will have splits within those sets. Yeah. And yeah. some accents will have mergers where mm-hmm. you've got just like a Canadian accent, the lot words, thought words. And also cloth words as well, mm-hmm. because in mm-hmm. some accents, the word cloth would be pronounced cloth. Yes. So be different again, right? Yeah, I was totally going to say, when you did your awe, I can see that you've got maybe a bit more lip rounding than I would in either of those. And I think that's partly because of, like you said, you moved around in different places, so we carry that with us. So I thought that was really interesting. But I want to back up a little bit, because I feel like we just jumped off of the highest diving board we could into the land, into the pool of lexical sets, right? Because we're like suddenly into mergers and we're like, well, here is this and here is this. And I feel like maybe we can just kind of back up and be like, 
go with head words, right? So we said, here's a head word for mm -hmm. a group within a set. So maybe we can back up and we can talk a little bit more about like, what is a head word? Because we kind of touched on how the sets are different, but can we go back to like a head word, for example, being an example of some other words? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So usually the very first word at the top of the lexical set list is kit. Uh, mm -hmm. which is why a lot of actors call it a kit list. Mm -hmm. And so both of those words, kit and list, they both fit into the kit set. Mm -hmm. So kit is just one set that would represent lots of different words that would have that same vowel in it. But here's the thing. That vowel is probably going to be different depending on the accent. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. all the words in that set for that accent will yeah. all have the same sound. So for me, kit, list, symbol, which is written mm -hmm. with an S Y M B O L, all of those have the I eh sound in it in my accent. Whereas if you go to another accent, like, I don't know, Birmingham in England, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. that kit sound would actually be a lot closer. It would be a different vowel sound. It would be E, kit, mm -hmm. list, symbol for a lot mm -hmm. of words. E, mm -hmm. so a lot closer, but they all would have that vowel throughout all of those words. And kid is just one of 20. I think that's the nugget right there is to say that, okay, we've got a set of words and this mm -hmm. set of words each has a head word. And for that head word, we've got a group of words where for this set, all the words in that group match that head word, right? So for example, exactly. you just said, ah, for them, maybe that's a little bit tighter, but maybe for somebody else, just one of those words would be more open. Like it might be eh, right? More than what you're describing. So for a person in the group, the head word matches all the words in that group, right? Just to say, yes. and, and to reiterate too, exactly. spelling means nothing here, right? Spelling has nothing to do with this. It's the sound that matches there, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. As there we, we go. Know, the spelling in English is crazy it's, like it's atrocious and <laughs> it's, it's horrible we can't do anything you know people have tried to do things about it and try to regularize the spelling of english but mm. none of them have caught on none of those yeah. have taken off and and it frankly probably never will so yes. we're stuck with this weird system of spelling that we've inherited from being invaded by so many different languages and cultures. So, yeah, we feel like maybe it's too work, too much work to change. But if we just sat down and did it, it'd probably be better for everybody. But yeah, so we're saying think about the sound. And if you know IPA, for example, that's a good start. But even that, like you said, there's variations in there too that we might listen to as well. I'm curious if you have the same problem that I do with lexical sets or let's say traditional lexical sets when people say the kit vowel when they say the fleece vowel because i know you have also taught in your life a lot of people whose first language isn't english and i've come across this trouble where they're like you, you didn't you just spend the next two minutes talking about what fleece means and it becomes a vocabulary lesson rather than the idea of trying to talk about your sounds and how they should be consistent so that's a trouble that i have with a lot of these lexical sets do you have the same issue I don't usually have that issue so much. I do know what you mean, but mm -hmm. I try not to get into <laughs> into too much of a vocabulary lesson. I know totally how that could be a problem where it could really derail a mm -hmm. lesson where it's like, mm -hmm. teacher, what is fleece? Right? Because fleece <laughs> is a head word. That's one of the head words for one of the sets, right? Yes. And yeah. then of course you could, uh, I, I often will say, well, look it up, right? <laughs> look, it, look it up. You got a dictionary, look it up and find mm -hmm. out. But mm -hmm. but that's that's a really good point that the actual words, the only relevance of the words that are the headers for each of those sets, the only relevance is that it has that sound in them. And the other thing that you touched upon was like, if we call it the kit vowel or the fleece yeah. vowel, mm -hmm. the problem, of course, is that people might interpret that as, uh, oh, well, it is the kit vowel. Mm -hmm. Well, not in all accents, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've already explained earlier on, if you're from a different city, it could be kit, it yeah. could be kit. Like if mm -hmm. you're from New Zealand, a lot of New Zealanders would pronounce it kut. So it's closer to a schwa, Almost, like a yeah, flat yeah. schwa for, for mm -hmm. them. So it is important to remember and keep in mind that each of these sets are actually just representative of a, a, a syllable in a right, certain right. word 
for any accent in English, but the vowel itself will be realized in different ways depending on where that person's from. Yeah, to summarize, it's not like the head word is the one that's the same in all the different accents. It's just to say, here's an example. And it's probably not even the highest frequency word in that group of words, right? It's just an exactly. example and kind of like the spelling. I guess we just picked it to be a head word and it just kind of stuck there, right? Well, so. It, yeah, I really feel that I should do my due diligence here and explain who came up with the whole idea. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it was because also the guy's still alive. So, yeah, you know, it wasn't that long ago, actually. Across this, you might be thinking, Excuse me, hello, I came up with this <laughs> idea. Because it wasn't me. That's for sure. Angry, that angry comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was actually, it was a British linguist called John C. Wells. I have no idea what the C stands for, <laughs> but you know, you look it up, look it up. Not, so, not um, like you. It's not like Byron is just there, right? Yeah. He didn't, he didn't seem to I'm need sure it. it stands yeah. for something. Uh -huh. I'm sure yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. some kind of like Charlie or something. But anyway, uh -huh. John C. Wells, like I said, he's still around. He's a phonologist, I believe. So he studies sounds. He studies the sounds in language and languages. And back in the 1980s, uh, probably before most of your viewers were born, but <laughs> back when but I was a, a, a child, back, mm -hmm. way back when, he came up with this concept, this idea, when he was writing some books on sounds and phonology and so on. And he figured out that there was a, a regular, was like a regularity. There was a system going on within English. He figured out that there's around about 20 sounds. And what he did was he compared... RP, which is the, the so-called standard accent of British English that you might hear on the BBC sometimes. And back then in the 1980s, most broadcasters on television mm. and radio would have spoken in that kind of accent. And, and mm. maybe the sort of accent that you'd hear from, you know, actors like Dame Judi Dench. Or, so that what he chose that as a comparison accent and compared it with general american which is mm -hmm. an, another kind of broadcast exactly. standard accent is used in the united states mm -hmm. so what he did was he compared the the two accents and, and the actual sounds that are in different words and figured out that there was this kind of a structure that repeats and that is very much the same between the accents but with different vowel sounds in each one and after a while, he figured out that it's not consistent with every accent. So you go to different accents of English around the world, like South Africa and Australia and New Zealand, the hundreds of different accents in the UK, right, in Britain, because you and I know there's no such thing as the British accent. There's yeah. like hundreds of British uh -huh, accents. Uh -huh, okay? uh -huh. Smacked into a much smaller area than exactly. the US and Canada, right? Yeah, North Much American. smaller, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Because the language has been spoken there for much longer than it has anywhere else. Hence yeah. why it's called English, right? Because mm -hmm. it was spoken in England and so on and so forth. So yeah, he figured this out. And then other linguists figured that, oh, this is a great idea. Oh, this is going to help me learn more about these accents. And then later on, dialect coaches were doing the same thing. Like, this is amazing. This really helps with teaching our actors, our students, you know, this kind of a set. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like a master key mm. to learning the kinds of structures that will allow you to predict how certain words will be pronounced in certain accents. You can categorize it. You can file it away. Whenever you learn a new word, you can say, oh, this goes in this category. And it makes it much easier for, well, I would say for actors, even if their native language is the same, or right? even if dialect is the same, right? Learning oh, yeah. a different accent, learning a different language when you're learning vocabulary, like we said, the spelling isn't helpful. So thinking of it in terms of the sounds and putting it in that each little pocket that it belongs in can be super, super helpful because to me, it's like the key to a map. Maybe it's the map of your mm -hmm. mouth. Maybe it's how you're mapping things in your brain, but to me, it's a key. And if we can unlock a lot of things for that. So yeah, lexical sets, super, super important. Even and like we said, for native speakers too, but if you're learning this or learning another accent that you're not familiar with, this is your gold standard, right? This is how you do it. You pick a set and you peg the words to it. At least that's how I think of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I remember when I was doing my certification with Knight Thompson speech work, I remember one of my fellow students had buckets, literally had buckets. And she was getting students, the student actors, to put sound, certain words, into buckets oh. with symbols on them. 
right? Nice. With the, the, the names of the lexical sets and on mm-hmm. each of them. And getting them to put the words in based upon how they said it in their own accent. Because one thing that we have to remember is yeah. that this is not a key for teaching people how you should sound or mm-hmm. how a word should be pronounced. Mm-hmm. Like some mm-hmm. people still go to a dictionary and go, oh no, that's not how you pronounce it. It's pronounced this way. Mm-hmm. Well, a dictionary mm-hmm. really tells you how most people pronounce it in a particular yeah. accent in mm-hmm. terms of a majority. It doesn't tell you how it's supposed to be. Right, um, right. But it, it just represents what they found, the, the lexicographers, the people who, who make dictionaries, what they've heard. And yeah, those yeah. change over time as well. So mm-hmm. they listen to what they hear, they write it down. So basically, that's a, one disclaimer that people need to remember is mm-hmm. that these are not like, oh, you, it should sound like this, right? That word should be that. No, yeah. it's basically, oh, in this accent, that word falls into this set. Mm -hmm. And in this one, it falls into that set. That's one thing to remember. That is also how it can be so useful too. If you know one set and you're trying to learn another set, you can then look and see where do they overlap? Where do they swap? You know, which word in this bucket should really be in this bucket or should be, but for what I'm trying to achieve here, you know, and that can actually be part of its strength, I think too, even though it's Mm -hmm. terribly confusing probably for a lot of people because there's a lot of ambiguity around this Um, right (laughs) and we're trying to like corral all the kittens and it doesn't work very well but we're still going to try our damnedest to like set it up in such a way that it makes the most sense maybe to the most people i would say yeah yeah and obviously a lot of people they'll try to go for consistency right Mm -hmm. because the thing is it is about patterns all languages are about patterning the the whole thing the whole concept of speaking right Mm -hmm. as humans we've been speaking for like probably a hundred thousand years And that may sound like a long time, but in terms of our existence as modern humans, like Mm -hmm. for such a long time, we just didn't talk. (laughs) It was a technology we didn't use for tens or hundreds of thousands of years because not that we couldn't, but we just didn't. And after a while, it's like, oh, we can put these sounds together. They're like arbitrary noises that we can make and put them in a certain order. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. Language was invented. And I'm not talking about writing. Writing came a lot later. The arbitrariness of like putting certain sounds that you can make with your mouth and your nose, putting those in a particular order and then agreeing between you that, oh, that series of sounds, Mm -hmm. that means that. And that's what culture is, baby. Culture is us solving that problem. And that's why you get different languages developing in different places in different ways, because we have to decide amongst us or between us at least, and then it'll spread. And maybe there's a mountain chain here. And even though we're kind of close to our our neighbors, if there's a mountain between us, we're probably going to end up with two very different ways of solving that problem. Exactly. So, I mean, that's another word that is one of my dialect coaches' words of the day, and that is convergence. Because Mm. when groups are separated and they don't get to hang out with each other for a a long time, they start to sound different. They Mm -hmm. diverge. Mm -hmm. But then when when you're hanging out with people, you naturally start to converge a little bit, not just with their accent, but their speech patterns and everything. This is the story of languages and and accents as well. Mm -hmm. The convergence, divergence, mixing and... uh, what makes this beautiful kind of rainbow colors of language. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Let's also touch on the idea of transcription as well, because that can kind of like simplify transcription. But also when I'm comparing accents, like you said, it makes it easier. Lexical sets make that easier. It's a tool that we can use. I don't want to say simplify, but it's a reference that we can use in order to simplify that. Also, for anybody who's learning vocabulary, myself included, when I learn a new word, what was I watching yesterday? Do you know the show Taskmaster? Have you ever watched it? I have seen an episode or two. Yeah, yeah. They've got a brother, Canadian one too, but it's in French. But we were yeah, watching the older version. Yeah, I think it's one of those. Yeah, it's one of those shows. It's like a reality show that they've got versions of everywhere. And yeah, I heard about yeah, it's about spread it. just like language. But somebody said the word unguent yesterday. And I was like, I'm pretty sure it's unguent, un- unguent. My roommate was like, that's a word I've never heard before. And so yeah. even as native speakers, we're widening our vocabulary. And when we acquire new words, whether or not it's correct or incorrect, let's put that in quotes, you want to know at least a baseline of yourself. How am I going to say it in my own brain when I'm thinking of the word, when I'm reading the word? What am I going to think about, even if it never even escapes your lips? So vocabulary learning can be very much 
enhanced by using lexical sets, I would say, because you have to have some kind of frame of reference. And then also, like we said, learning it, not just comparing accents, but if you're going to learn an accent, a lexical set can be really key to do that. There's a lot of benefits to lexical sets. And you said there's so many of them out there. Do you have a preference for one? Do you create your own? Well, how does that work for you? When you say like a preference for one what? One set, like, specific set. Like, do you set? always use the Wells set? Yeah. Or do you do you just kind of like see what oh. other people already know? Or do you kind of invent oh, your own you as mean. you go? So what you mean is like, do I have a preference for it? Like John Wells is exactly of yeah, the set yeah. Uh -huh, or somebody uh -huh. else. I don't know of any others that exist that are oh, out. Oh, okay. I'm hmm. not aware of it. As far as I understand, John Wells's list of lexical sets is the only one in existence, as far as I'm aware. Ah, right? okay. Okay, because so I feel like I've seen others. Like a, yeah, it's, it's, it's like the official framework that yeah, any yeah. others will be based upon. I mean, I've been toying with the idea of doing one that is just colors, and I've probably got about 75% of them. So yeah. I've got like, instead of the kit, the kit set i've got the yeah. pink set right mm -hmm. pink mm -hmm. is in that set i've got yeah. instead of the dress set i've got yeah. red instead of the trap set i've got black but i've still got like another kind of maybe 10 or 12 things to try to squeeze into colors like color names because uh. all the well-known color names they overlap I it's totally get the idea because I don't want to burst your bubble, but I'm pretty sure it already exists. And that's called the color vowel chart. Yeah, sorry. Whoa. Yes, I'm sorry. Awesome. Yeah, it's called the color vowel chart. And it was made by, I'm looking at it now, Karen Taylor and Shirley Thompson. It was in a book. And the reason I found it was because I used to teach English abroad and I was working for the embassy years ago in, in Jordan. And when you work for the U.S. State Department, right, you get all these resources. And yeah. it, we got it as a resource way back when. And I love Loved it back then and people have been kind of using it and transforming it and morphing it and things like that so i would say take a look at that and then it's see what's easy. missing because when i look at it too i'm like hmm i have something to add to this because like we said it's not black and white it's not like here's the set and it's good for everyone good to go no we want to kind of i think change those yeah. and manipulate them for other people too sure. so think about yeah. that Maybe along yeah. those lines, something I find useful because a lot of my clients do not have English as their first language, then what I do is, like I said, I, I'll take like the word kit and fleece and kind of throw it out the window and I'll just have different head words more than anything. And then use that to see what words they already know that they're matching with those. For example, instead of kit, I'll say bit. And I've tried to kind of, yeah. not exactly, but as much as possible, make them minimal pairs and high frequency yeah. words. So for example, I would say like bit, Sorry, beat, bit, bait, bet, and bat. As concise yeah. as I can be, but also as recognizable as possible. So I don't know if you've toyed that with that sense. idea, but yeah, color yeah. colors are fabulous because they're so easy to remember as well. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why I was playing around with it and thinking, there could be a color one. I, little did I know it already exists. So I'm going to go and check that out and, and find out, see if there's any any gaps in there. Yeah, there, exactly. Uh, and you might have something that fills in for that too, because I know I've looked at it and I'm like, hmm, this all still needs some work, you know, not needs work, but I would probably do it a little bit differently is what I'm trying to say. And you see that in a lot of books as well. Basically, what I do is I'll use those lexical set words just out of consistency, just to mm. make sure that when I'm working with clients, when I'm working with actors, that I will use those just to familiarize them mm -hmm. with that and use mm -hmm. the same word each time so they know, oh, that's that sound. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll be able to link it to a certain sound. And yeah. that's all, really. Yeah. And also actors might already come with that knowledge because at some point they've seen the Wells lexical set. So it's an easy reference point, at least to begin exactly. with, but it's familiar enough for them because, oh yeah, a lot of actors will know that at least already. Exactly. Tell us a little bit more about your words of the day and maybe anything right. that's also related to here. Is there any other vocabulary or lexicon we should know about lexical sets? So vocabulary to do with lexical sets. Yeah. Well, one I think I've, I've used earlier, which was thong which is a little bit tricky to say, but it's spelled P-H-T-H-O-N-G. Mm -hmm. So thong is a word that's not often used alone. I mean, <laughs> like it's not, a word, it's not a word that you often hear without having... Without a, something else, without like a else, suffix like or example, prefix mono. more likely. Mm -hmm. So basically a thong is a kind of a vowel or a bunch of vowels stuck together in one syllable. So mm -hmm. this is the whole concept of what lexical sets are, is that each one 
contains a thong. It's based uh-huh. on a thong. So you've got monophongs where it's just one vowel sound, like a, eh, a, ah, or well, any of those, right? And you've got mm-hmm. diphthong. Mono, of course, being one and die meaning two. So a diphthong, that would be like a, or it could be o. Mm-hmm. And in different accents, the, sometimes a, a monophong could be a diphthong and vice versa. So for example, day, that is a diphthong in the face set. Mm-hmm. But in other accents, that could be a monophong. So some Canadians might say day. Mm-hmm. And also in the north of England, some accents up there, like in Yorkshire, you'd hear de and mm-hmm. say and mm-hmm. pay within that face set or face set. So yeah. that's monophone versus diphthong. And if you go, of course, into uh, just north of where you are, way south of where I am, mm-hmm. into the south of the United States, that you're going to hear uh, instead of pan or pan, you're going to mm-hmm. hear pan, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Pan. Mm-hmm. I, uh, so three all together yeah. making a triphong. <laughs> so thong is an important word. And I like that word because even though it's a new word for a lot of people, it might be a little bit intimidating. It's really important because like we said, going back to the spelling thing, it's not transparent. It's not like what you see is what you say in English. So when I say the word vowel, do you mean what I'm writing or do you mean the sounds that are coming out of my mouth? I think this word is important because it's about what's the sound, the vowel sound versus the vowel on paper. You know what I mean? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why I always try to remember to say vowel sound because yeah. people understandably get confused with that because like at school, I don't know if you remember, but I remember at school being taught that, okay, the vowels are A, E, I, O, and U and sometimes Y. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then you say, teacher, why? And they say, well, <laughs> yes, done. that's a vowel. Well, no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why. Why is that? No, but why? <laughs> yeah. why? Why are those the vowels? Oh, well, because all the other 21 letters are consonants. Uh, yes. So, yes. Yeah. And so you don't actually get taught what it means. And that is uh-huh. just the orthography. It is just the way that we spell things, the way we write these words down mm-hmm. to very mm-hmm. roughly represent the actual consonant sounds and the actual vowel sounds that we're making. And that one is they have different features, like whereas a vowel sound is just made by really the, the shape of the tongue and where it is in the mouth. And it's not mm-hmm. really doing anything. It's just kind of it's making shaping the air just slightly yeah. you know shaping yeah yeah air, exactly. uh-huh that's uh-huh shaping yeah. the flow right and that's right. a continuum Constant. too right because then we have our va- vowels again right we have vowels and then we have semi-vowels and we have liquid sounds and the line gets kind of blurred exactly. all the way to consonants and you say oh well Absolutely. we've got these fricatives well i'm just creating friction what's really the difference so yes. yeah i love our job because there's so much ambiguity that i can really like just nerd out on all the little things and, and it gives a lot of things to explain i find it very interesting confusing oh, yeah. annoying at times but interesting i would say yeah absolutely that's the thing i think part of the challenge of our jobs is to try not to it's so easy to be annoying right? it's like <laughs> oh here's another thing i know about <laughs> let me explain all this to you and it's like what do we need to like i'm but- that person at the party yeah totally yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes. But the thing is, is we're trying to explain the systems, right? We're trying to explain systems. We're trying to explain repetition, things that are true in almost all cases or most cases. And then we have to go, except for this, mm-hmm. oh, except for that. And it's like you said, <laughs> there are so many divisions between what is one thing and what is another. Like you yeah. mentioned about liquids and glides, you know, mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. that. These are kind of consonants but they're kind of vowelly consonants and so it it, it mm-hmm. is like it's you get closer it's like any picture you look at the picture you go closer you can see details in there that, is it a duck you know, is it a rabbit? <laughs> You're not always sure. And I think like what you said, it's more about the teaching and okay, like how can I simplify this and f- make a framework, but not be confusing and not open the can of worms? Because yeah, I could talk about this all day. You could talk about this all day. Did you ever see that show, Drunk History? Oh, I love that. Yes. Oh my yeah. God. They should have drunk linguists. That would be the best. <laughs> I would watch that. 
<laughs> there's something for us to start. <laughs> there you go. Yes, <laughs> drunk accent coaches, drunk fun, drunk yeah. phoneticians. Like that's that's our new that's our new HBO special. But yeah, I feel like I don't know about you, but I have a lot of fun, you know, talking to people like you about this too, because we get to just put all the cards on the table, nerd out about it, and then when people listen to this, they pick up what they want to pick up, and then they just leave the rest, which is totally fine with me. So. Are there any other words of the day that you want to mention? And by the way, if anybody's interested in these words of the day, Mark has them on his TikTok, on his Instagram. You can go searching for those and you'll get a little explanation, a little bite-sized explanation for each of those, which is really exciting. So any others that you can think of that might relate to this today? Things that would relate to this today. Let me have a think. So I've mentioned thong. I've mentioned convergence. (laughs) Another one would be phony. It's like phone me. (laughs) <laughs> but you stick the two words together, it becomes phoneme. Yeah, it rhymes with meme. Yeah. Phone so and meme. Mm-hmm. This is basically, it's another word for a type of sound. But you know how we talk about phonetics and how mm-hmm. phonetics is about different phones and a yeah. phone is a speech sound because, mm-hmm. I mean, that's where we get the word telephone, right? Telephone mm-hmm. means bar sound. So use the word phone to mean the actual sounds that we use when we're talking, the actual ones that come out. Whereas a phoneme is actually more of a concept. And those are different in different languages as well. I I can give you an example of... uh, Yeah, sure, sure. uh, For example, think about the word top, and Mm -hmm. then you put an S in front of that, and it becomes stop, Mm -hmm. okay? And, And then the word pot, Right Mm -hmm. now, we think of all of those as having a letter T in there. And that T is a phoneme, it's a concept. But the reality is that the T in each of those under that phoneme, that concept of the letter T is actually a different phone each Mm -hmm. time in top. In English, we have that little puff of air that we Mm -hmm. call aspiration. It's aspirated. So it's a T, right? Instead of T, it's T, right? So we have top. But when we put an S in front of it, we don't say stop. We say stop, right? Well, most we of us. That, I right? bet there's some people that do. Yeah. 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 Most of us, exactly. So it mm-hmm. depends on your accent, right? Mm-hmm, if you're from mm-hmm. India, you wouldn't say top, you'd say top, right? Mm-hmm. Most people with Indian accents or accents that come from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh, mostly they will not aspirate that T at the beginning or a P at the beginning of a word. But in in other accents, many other accents, it will be aspirated unless it's got an S in front of it. So it's a different sound. And at the end of the word, you might say pot or you might say pot. So Mm -hmm. in that case, Mm -hmm. the the T is not released. There's no puff of air. There's no release at all. There's no vowel after it. So it might be pot or it might be turned into a glottal stop Mm -hmm. in some accents. So, for example, in many English accents, it will be pop. It will be like pop. Or mm-hmm. mate, all right, mate, all right. Mm-hmm. So the, mm-hmm. that becomes a glottal stop where you're stopping the air here in the glottis. Mm-hmm. So it's still a T. It's still the idea, the concept of a T, but it's realized with different phones. So these different sounds, different speech sounds that you and I know as allophones, right? Yes. Like other sounds, but mm-hmm. they all come under this concept of a phoneme mm-hmm. and they're different. Yeah. We group them in different languages. So Spanish will group them in different ways. So a phoneme for like we might write as a letter D in Spanish for a Spanish speaker, the speech sound the, which we yep. think of as a TH sound. Yep. It's just another version of the D. For example, like dama, dama mm-hmm. is at the beginning of a word, but edad is a different phone, but considered mm-hmm. to be in that language, the same sound. A variation, allophonic variation of the sound, right? Yeah, absolutely. For me, that's a really great word to end on because I feel like it kind of widens it back out to the idea of like, oh, well, how do I organize these thoughts in my head, these thoughts about sound, right? So just like we have the the framework of a lexical set, we can also maybe know more vocabulary related to these things so that we can be better at understanding and explaining how these things work and how we can wrap our heads around them and learn them or be interested in them. Because to me, even if you you don't want a different accent, I think it's still interesting. It's still fascinating. It shows so much about our culture. So I think it's important just for that reason. Exactly. And it's just another way of being able to quantify things and structure them and see the patterns and things because it's all about patterns and, mm-hmm. and becoming aware of 
our different accents and our different languages as well. I, I mentioned Spanish is a different language that you know divides things and organizes things in a different way compared to English, Japanese as well. A another thing where those sounds are all very different. Yeah. And that's what comes through. If we're learning another language, our ideas, what we've grown up with, learning mm -hmm. our first language, that will often seep through into the language we're learning. Mm -hmm. So if I'm learning Japanese, for example, then I might call Mount Fuji, I might call it Fuji-san, but there's no sound in Japanese. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in Japanese, it is Fuji-san. Uh -huh. So it's not quite the same sound. Right. And if I wanted to say like a name of a city, a very famous city in Japan would be what an English speaker might call Hiroshima, or mm -hmm. if you're British, Hiroshima. Mm -hmm, but it, mm -hmm. in Japanese, it's not Hiroshima. It's not like the same concept of a letter H. Yeah, it's yep. actually chi, chi. Mm -hmm. So not chi, but chi. The tongue mm -hmm. is a little bit further back and it's Hiroshima. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. it's completely different. Yeah. And there's things that we aren't even aware of when we're first learning a language. So we can only kind of peg it to what we already know. So what we already know influences how we receive things. And of course, then how we produce things too. Yeah. I think being aware of that perception bias is really important because you say, hmm, this is what I think is going on, but there might be stuff there that I don't even know. We can say to learn more about these things, follow Mark on Instagram, on TikTok, Mark Byron Dallas. And I think you also have a newsletter we can sign up for too, right? Yeah. If you go to talklikethat.com slash sign up, all one word, you can sign up to my newsletter. I promise I won't spam you. Well, if you <laughs> sign up, I'm not spam spamming you technically, but I mean, I don't send out that many things, but mm -hmm. if you are interested in this kind of stuff, I do send up out updates and stuff like that. Updates about courses, new courses I'm doing, and uh, also resources. I share a lot of resources that come for free. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way to get people interested more than anything is just say, hey, look at this. This helps you understand. I know where you're coming from. Just that alone is worth signing up for something like that. So I, I would encourage anybody listening to sign up for Mark's emails and also check out his Instagram because he's doing really good reels, really interesting shorts. And I want to say thanks again, Mark, for coming today to talk about lexical sets because it's something that I wanted to talk about for a while and you really had a great idea to link it to your word of the day. So thanks again for coming today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on Bianca. Awesome. Anytime. All right, cool. Talk Talk to you soon then. Bye. Catch you later. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I did. There's a lot of vocabulary that we threw at you today, but it's all really useful. So if you need any help with that, feel free to reach out to either Mark or myself, and we're happy to help you with that. If you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe and leave a review. It's actually really helpful to me. Now, before I go, I have two tasks for you to do. First, I want you to register and come to my free monthly masterclass. They're on the last Thursday of the month. In just one hour, you're going to master a specific American accent skill. For example, the TH sound or rhythm. The second and maybe more important thing I want to ask you to do is to sign up for my mailing list because you're going to get the registration link each month and you're going to get bonus materials before and after the master class that I only send to my email list subscribers. The email opt-in link is down in the show notes. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I want you to know that your voice is your choice. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the show. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.